Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Nari Ishmani. I'm a board certified OBGYN north of the Seattle, Washington area in Everett, Washington. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about cervical cancer screening. Um, so to start with, um, what's the cervix? At the top of the vagina, the opening going into the uterus, you've got the cervix there. And so what's the cancer? Uh, cancer is basically when cells start growing at their own pace without any kind of control and they can invade surrounding tissue and things like that. So cervical cancer is essentially uh, those undifferentiated cells of the cervix just growing into uh, organs and, and causing harm. Uh, there's two kinds of cervical cancer out there. There's adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. The majority of cervical cancers are squamous cell carcinoma, so a lot of what we're going to talk to is just the general cancer screening guidelines and a little focus on the squamous cell carcinoma. So basically, in the cervix, you've got inside, you've got some columnar or glandular cells, and then outside, you've got some squamous cells. And so where these two come together is the squamocolumnar junction. That's an area where you can get these precancers, or you also hear us refer to that as cervical dysplasia, um, that can turn into a cervical cancer. Now, if you take a look at it and go, what causes these cervical cancers? Uh, the underlying reason and the underlying cause of this is HPV, or the human papillomavirus. HPV, it is a sexually transmitted disease. It's extremely common. So, you know, most people who have been sexually active have encountered it at some point. In the majority of people, HPV is transient, meaning they encounter it, their body suppresses it and clears the virus, and then it's not a big deal. In fact, in most cases, HPV is cleared in around eight months, and the vast majority of cases, they're cleared or suppressed within two years. But in some cases where you get persistent HPV infection, that can cause these abnormal cells to become, I mean, these cells of the cervix to become abnormal or cancerous. Now, it's not all forms of HPV, so oftentimes patients, when they hear HPV, they're thinking of things like condyloma or genital warts. Now, those are caused by HPV, but you've got oncogenic and non-oncogenic strains of HPV. More commonly, you're going to hear us refer to them as high-risk and low-risk strains of HPV. The low-risk strains, we kind of pay less attention to because while they can cause uh, disturbing things like genital warts, they're not the strains of HPV that cause cervical precancer cancer. Those are the high-risk strains. And then of the high-risk strains, really there's a focus. There's two types of high-risk strains, type 16 and type 18, and those account for the vast majority of all cervical cancers. Uh, type 16, for instance, is about 50% of all the cervical cancers. Type 18 is about 10 to 15%. So what happens is people encounter the HPV virus, and if the body doesn't suppress it, it can cause precancers change and cancers change. Both men and women can get the HPV virus. It's just we don't have a good screening tool or test for men uh, versus for women, what we do for cervical cancer screening is the pap smear, and then in certain age groups, we combine that with testing for HPV. So what's the pap smear? Um, you know, the pap smear, Dr. Papanikolaou, a Greek doctor who was working at Cornell University at the time, uh, did a lot of research into this and then published a book uh, in 1942 that outlined and said, look, we can figure out and find out and identify these precancers or cancers uh, by taking basically uh, some cells from the cervix with a little swab and taking a look at them under a microscope. And so that's that's the pap smear, the Papanikolaos smear. Uh, so over time, we also, when we had more information and discovered everything about the HPV virus, we discovered we can also test for the HPV virus in some specimens, and that can help guide us. You know, when we really look at this, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do with cervical cancer screening is we're trying to pick up as much uh, cases of abnormal precancerous cells before they become a cancer and so that we can intervene and we can prevent that. But we're also balancing that with the cost, the stress, you know, the discomfort of doing procedures. Uh, so what are current pap smear guidelines and the, and the theories and thoughts behind it? So right now we start pap smears at the age of 21. The reason for that, you know, if you take a look at people under 21, uh, women have high incidence of HPV, but they also have a high clearance rate of HPV, and they have a very low incidence of cervical cancer. So the incidence of cervical cancer in people under 21 in women is less than 0.1%. So that's why screening doesn't start until 21. Now, in the 20s, we just do a pap smear every three years. Uh, we don't co-test with the HPV test, and the reason for that is, is a vast number of women will have the HPV virus, but most of those are not going to go on to precancerous cancerous change. And so it doesn't really add much for us to do the HPV test in that age group, or at least that's what our data says right now. Um, 
women will often ask me, well, is every three years okay? Because then when women are over 30, our pap smears go to every five years and we co-test with the HPV virus to give us some additional information because we see less HPV in that group. And you know, the thought with the spacing out, and this is something that happened in the last couple years with pap smears, is that cervical cancers are slow processes. So from start to finish, you're talking about probably a 10 year process, even from high grade abnormal changes on your cervix to a cancer, you're probably looking at three to seven years. So this takes a long time. So the idea with the screening is to try to catch this process before it goes too far if we've got to do anything uh, about it. Um, now, what are the things that you, you can do to help your body clear the HPV virus? You know, if you're a smoker, stopping smoking because smoking is an independent risk factor for cervical cancer. Um, if you've got a lower immune system because of any medications, things like that, people with HIV are going to have lower immune systems and they're going to be more prone to these precancerous or cancerous changes. Otherwise, it's just a matter of giving the body time. So, you know, we do the pap smear and what happens when your pap smear is abnormal? Uh, well, the next step, that is a cellular diagnosis, or it's basically looking at some cells on the cervix and saying look, they look abnormal, but it's not an actual tissue diagnosis. So then the next thing that we've got to do is we've got to do what's called a colposcopy. Uh, so colpos means is a Greek for womb, oscopy is to look. So we look at the cervix. Basically, we've got this big magnifying glass, and we're going to look at the cervix, and we're going to try to figure out what made the pap smear abnormal. When we look at the cervix, we've got some uh, some solutions we can put on the cervix to kind of help and take us to, to take a better look. So acetic acid, which is a commonly a mild vinegar solution, that's something that we're going to use. We put it on the cervix, and you'll feel a little bit of tingling and things like that. And what happens is abnormal cells have more DNA, so they highlight white or acetyl white change, among other things. We also have another solution called Lugol's, which is an iodine-based solution, and you get poor uptake in abnormal cells, so that area is going to be a little bit lighter instead of darker. And so we use this, and we just we have experience over time of saying what looks abnormal, and then we'll take a biopsy of whatever's abnormal at time of colposcopy. We send that to the pathologist, and they come back and they tell us, okay, this is normal, this is cancer, or something in between, meaning CIN one, two, or three, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia fancy way of saying mild, moderate, and severe. And just kind of big picture, most of the mild changes or CIN ones go away on their own, so we recommend a repeat pap down the road. Whereas things that are CIN two or three, the moderate to severe, have a higher likelihood of going on to cancer. So we might recommend a treatment procedure like a cleep or a cold knife cone or, or something of that nature. But the important thing with the cervical cancer screening is, again, it's a slow process. We're trying to pick these things up. We're giving your body time to take care of this. And if it doesn't, that's when we step in and ask, well, how successful is cervical cancer screening? You know, in the last 30 years, when all of these new guidelines and everything were implemented for cervical cancer screening, we've dropped the incidence of cervical cancer in the United States by 50%. In fact, half of all women who develop cervical cancer have never had a pap smear. So that's why it's really important to go in you know, follow up with your screening PAPs, really all of your screening guidelines out there. Um, one of the other things that could be a game changer down the road that's going to affect some of this is, you know, with every screening test, we look at how common is it in the population, how much intervention do we want to do versus how much extra testing are we doing. Well, the HPV vaccinations. So these HPV vaccinations, um, they're recommended uh, for boys and girls ages 11 to 12, and they can really be done anywhere from 9 to 26. But the idea is we want to vaccinate children before they ever become sexually active, before they encounter these HPV strains, and provide them protection so that they don't get the HPV virus and they don't transmit the HPV virus. And the benefits, some of the vaccines even uh, prevent against not only the high risk strains that can cause cervical cancer, but low risk strains out there for things like condyloma, genital warts, that's one of the most common STDs out there. So. 10, 20 years from now, we might see a completely different landscape of who has cervical cancer. We might see changes in these PAP guidelines and things like that as it progresses. So, you know, that's the basic info on cervical cancer. It's a slow process. The HPV virus causes it. HPV virus is really common. We're going to watch it. We're going to give your body time to take care of it. And if we have to intervene, then we'll intervene and go from there. So I hope that was helpful.